Welcome and thank you for joining in to another show of uh, our YFC podcast. And today we've got Stuart Housen, one of the uh, great founders of uh, What the Dubai Cycle Culture is here in Dubai today. Stuart, welcome. Thank you. Uh, one of our um, only repetitive questions in every podcast. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, my name is Stuart Housen. I am the uh, managing partner of Revolution Cycles Dubai, um, founder of the Spinnies Dubai 92 Cycle Challenge. Um, and I've lived in Dubai since 2008. Avid cyclist uh, with a passion for putting on events, riding, bikes, and anything to do with biking and having fun. Fantastic. Now, now where does that passion come from? Because I mean, we're going to elaborate it while we're in the podcast, but you are very deeply rooted into the cycling culture in Dubai. So that obviously stems from a passion that you have for it. Where does this passion come from? Where did it start? I think it started um, back in my school days when um, the, coming from a background in, in South Africa, when I grew up in South Africa, I was born in Scotland. We moved to South Africa when I was uh, seven years old. And... Um, it was at a time where it was easy to get around in South Africa on a bicycle. Um, there wasn't a lot of public transport, so use your bicycle and, you know, the place was relatively safe. So you would use your bike to go to school. You know, we came from a, a family that was working class family. So it was a case of we're not going on the bus because, you know, just don't need to spend that kind of money on the bus. Let's get you a bicycle and you can use your bicycle for your transport and get to and from work and to, to and from school. And that's kind of where it started. And, um, I was never big into to cricket or, or rugby or swimming or any of the, the academic sports at school. And um, a little bit of a rebel. So when I found out that uh, it, it upset the, the teachers at school that I wasn't taking part in a school curriculum, that I was out riding my bike, it just encouraged me to, to do it more. Ah. So I, th I think it's, it's kind of one of my trends is when somebody tends to say to you, you can't do this or that's going to be difficult. And you go, well, there's a red flag. I'll, I'll take a challenge on that. And <laughs> Yeah, and that's where the passion came into it and started racing and riding my bike from probably about nine, ten years old. Um, Mom got me my first bike and my first race bike. Um, interesting story about that was uh, the first time I'd uh, used the, the clipless pedals. And in those days, it wasn't the look pedals where your foot clips in. It was yeah. the, the toe straps. You put your foot into the cage and pull the strap up. So I just got my brand new bike, got new pedals on. Thought, Good idea to go out for a ride. Dressed in my Lycra, helmet on. And off I go, and I'm putting my foot into the pedal, and I see this car come past me. I think, go, this car's there, it's gone. So I go down, and I'm busy mucking around with the pedal, trying to get it in, get it strapped in, get it tight, and I just hear this beep. I look up, and that was me, straight into the back of the car. Ooh. The car had stopped 100 meters down the road, and I just went straight into the back of it. So, yeah. <laughs> Good thing I was wearing a helmet, and that was my brand new bike, maybe with 100, maybe 200 meters on the clock. Oh, no. Written off, like, mom. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we took it back. The guys in SA were really good. They they, they did a, a proper job, replaced the frame for me. Back in the day specifically, I mean, I haven't been to South Africa in a long time, but but even now when I went back in August, there's a big cycling community in South Africa as Absolutely. well. Guys go on daily rides, and I mean, you're talking about, you know, 80, 90 kilometers a day, yep. um, which we will also get to. But obviously, when you came to Dubai, um, and, and I'm, I'm not talking about obviously years ago, but there, it, there wasn't a cycling culture. And one of the things that you were instru instrumental in was the establishing of um, cycle, cycle Safe. Yeah. So w what led to that and how did you get involved in that? So when I moved over and funnily enough, when I moved over, it was kind of like in two stages. And when people say to you, when did you move to Dubai? I was like, well, 2008, 2009. The reason for that is because I came over towards the end of December and brought my bike over, left my bike and then went to Scotland, had Christmas and New Year's with my mom. So I came back and that was the official time that, that I was here. So my bike was actually here and has been here for longer than I have. <laughs> um, and um, we were staying in uh, Amaruj Rotana at the time and the Burj was still being built. Um, and the only place to go and ride safely was out in the Maidan area and it was up towards the old Sheikh's Palace. Um, and uh, we'd always park in the mosque parking area. It was, it was really cool. It was, a, it was a nice atmosphere, but it was, a, it was about an eight or 10 kilometer loop. We go up and down and ride on. It got a bit boring coming from an environment where yeah. in South Africa or in the UK where you can go out for a ride and you just go. Um, and Dubai under development at that stage, there was lots of really good roads, but they're really fast roads with really fast cars. So not the kind of place that you want to be. Um, I met a good Australian friend uh, who's uh, a friend still. Um, and a business partner, and um, I was introduced to him at one of these networking meetings. 
And I said, you need to meet this guy, Nicholas Brooks. He's a fellow crazy cyclist like you. Go out for a ride. And Nick and I got together and um, we went up and down Maidan a couple of times and uh, rode around there and said, well, want to go for a ride on a, on a Saturday or Friday or Saturday morning. I went out for uh, a group ride with, uh, with one of the big groups around and just looked at and went, the things that was done just kind of didn't fit in with the way I had grown up on cycling, the, the safe environment for it, uh, the, the developmental stages of cycling. And it was mm. like somebody who's coming new to the group, it was difficult to, to, to integrate. So we're in like one or two of those rides and uh, said to Nick, look, let's find us a really, really quiet road in Dubai um, where we can go and take over that road. And, and that can be where we set up a group and we just start doing rides. And we set up, uh, I set up a, a Facebook page, I mean, it was 2008, 2009, years of tech, we know how young Facebook was at that stage. Yeah, um, 15 years ago, it was not like today, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, finding the, groups. <laughs> it was, yeah, it yeah. was the group, it was like, how do you yeah. put a group together? How do you, do you set this up? It was kind of weird. Uh, anyways, put this group together, Cycle Safe Dubai. And I was always thinking, do I call it Cycle Safe Dubai or Safe Cycle Dubai? And eventually went, oh, just took one of them. Um, and we set up a group ride for a Friday morning on Al Qudra. And people were like, where is Al Qudra? And well, there's location, pin, there's some photographs. It was just a road in the middle of nowhere at that stage. Oh, yeah, only heading to Bubble Shams. That was it. <laughs> yeah, that was the <laughs> only, yeah. only place we were going to, was going up to Bubble Shams. And another very iconic place. Yeah. But we didn't know this. So we set up Cycle Safe Dubai first Friday. I think we had two or three people. And I was, I was living in Layan at the time, um, which is probably the furthest away community. It was just up from Arabian Ranches. Well distinguishable, bright yellow buildings. Um, we moved in to there. There was a couple of Emirates pilots who were also a couple of South African boys and Namibian guys and Australian and an English lad. And um, yeah, I think it was five of us the first time. And then the Saturday there was five of us. And then we found a little coffee shop at Bubble Shams. Um, and we were just doing 35 kilometer distances and um, developed into the next week. And then the next week it was 10 people and it just grew and it grew and it grew. And so eventually we, um, maybe after a couple of years, we drew, drove over. There wasn't the bridge going over Alcala at the yeah. time. Um, drove up and down the highway and then over to go 100 meters. And as we came over the verge, there was just cars everywhere. There's cars on the right hand side, there's cars on the left hand side, cars all down the road. Like, what have we done? There's <laughs> just hundreds and hundreds of cyclists there. Like, Nick, this is a problem, mate. I mean, we were giving away free water and stuff. We didn't have the retail store at the time. It was yeah. There was nothing commercial about it at all. Yeah. It was just a case of the more of us on the road, the safety in numbers. And uh, another um, South African lad who had come off his bike years ago, passionate about cycling, um, but wanted to give something back to the community. He said, I'll drive my car behind you guys every every uh, every weekend. He would ride us every weekend up and down the road. And just that's how, how it kicked off. Wow. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And yeah. And is that what eventually led to the, the Spinnies Dubai 92 cycle event? Or how did that come about? Cycle, Spinnies Dubai 92 cycle challenge, it was... You could never plan this as a business plan. And you guys as business owners would know that there's, there's certain things that happen um, organically. Yeah. Um, and you go, well, I've had to plan that. If I had to put that in the, in the pipeline for a business plan or a business strategy and you go and invest it, they go, yeah, yeah, that's never going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it came about as we got CSD up and running. Um, and then I had some mates that had done a reality TV show in South Africa on Formula One. And they had moved over to Dubai to work in Dubai Autodrome. And um, before I got into ARN to do Dubai 92, I was kind of trying to get into there. So I got a hold of my mates over there and established good relationships with the, the guys on the track. In SA, we had done cycling around one of the racetracks there, Kalami Racetrack and Kilani down in Cape Town. So, well, let's see if we can do a copy paste kind of situation. Spoke to the guys, middle of summer. Um, Anthony Prophet says, Stuart, I've got an opening on the track for half an hour. Uh, do you want to come down and just make sure it's safe to ride your bike around? At that stage, nobody had ridden their bike around the Dubai Autodrome. I said, yes, yeah, sure, no problem. What time? Um, 12 o'clock to 12.30, middle of Dubai summer. <laughs> this is going to be good. This is going to be good. <laughs> Went down, did a lap around the track. I think I did three laps around the track. It was an out because they were like typical race cars. You've got to do the out lap from the pit lap, full lap, and then the in lap. So it was like three laps in 45, 50 degree ambient temperature. The temperature coming off the track I don't know, it was cook and egg type temperature. Anyway, so that was approved and we started doing the Wednesday nights. Every Wednesday night from six o'clock to nine o'clock, it was free access. Everyone could come in and ride on the track. And that got huge. We had moms and dads and kids. And the age gap, I'd always say, was um, kids in prams with the grandmothers pushing it. Everything in between from there to there. You wow. would have grannies pushing babies around the track. There'd be kids on push bikes, everything. 
the triathlon and the TT people that uh, would want to come down on the triathlon bikes or time trial bikes. Um, they would do their brick sessions, they do a run. It was good, it was really good. And the common question was coming back was like, we're getting so fit, we've got CSD on a, a Friday and Saturday in those days, we've got the auto room on a Wednesday night, what are we getting fit for? And it kind of hit that little thing in my head and I was still doing work with uh, Dubai 92. I thought, like, well, maybe we could potentially bring a race together. There was no amateur races going on. There was a lot of um, Emirati races, like the President's Cup and stuff. And uh, the UAE Cycling Federation was doing a lot for the UAE yeah. uh, nationals. There wasn't anything for us kind of weekend warriors that we just want to put on a Lycra and look yeah. like mammals out in the middle of the desert and <laughs> go and have fun. There wasn't anything for us. So I went to, I approached a guy, um, a friend of mine, another South African lady, Romy, and said to her, I need to find somebody who can put on events. Who do you know? Um, she said, well, I've done some work with a guy, uh, Donald Killerly. He owns uh, Promise 7 Sports Marketing. Have a chat with him. He's the CEO. I mean, I'm, I'm a radio guy. I'm like, I'm going to meet a CEO. I'm like, mm, okay, well, what do I need to do? And I've done a bit of research and think, what do CEOs like as presentations? Like one page, <laughs> to the point, just get in, da, 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 hit your points, get off. So... He would, I mean, under, if anybody didn't know, Promo 7 would run the, the MSA Alliance Rugby 7s. Yeah. That, yes. that yeah. was their gig. <clears throat> so when Romeo had said Promo 7, I did a bit of research and went, oh, okay, this is like big deal. Better not mess this up. Go to him, drop him a little meeting in, uh, I think it was, a, it, it may have been Acosta. Um, have <laughs> a meeting with him. He's like, yeah, love it. That was it. That's how we, we got the concept of the spinning to Well, at that stage, it was just a cycle challenge. It's just a cycle challenge. I work for ARN. Maybe with your contacts, you could uh, convince them to get on board as brand partner. Yeah. Um, and then at the time, I knew that, uh, that Spinney's was managed by a lot of South Africans. So it was all guys from Pick and Pay. It was guys from ShopRite Checkers. Yeah. And if anybody doesn't know, pick and pay and shop right checkers are very much like your spinnies here. It's it's a high end grocery store, mass produced or sorry, mass market. You know, they're they're all over the place. So they would sponsor majority of the races that I grew up riding. You know, the the Cape Town Cycle Tour was the pick and pay Cape Town Cycle Tour, the pick and pay fast one, it was the pick and pay ninety four seven. So everything had a, a grocery store as a sponsor. So Donald um, used his contacts to get a, a meeting for us with uh, Yanni Holzhausen, who was the CEO at the time. And again, being nervous about never being in corporate kind of situation, I was in <laughs> theater and, and stuff prior. Walked in to go see Yanni and uh, basically I think there was an immediately cool connection. We yeah. sit down, we chat. And he's like, so what's this, what's this about the race? What do you want it to do? So, well, one of, the target is to make a, a Cape Town cycle tour in Dubai. It's like, yeah, okay. Let's do it. It was <laughs> like that. It was, it was an immediate, like, there wasn't any if, ands, or buts. Yanni was like, yep, yeah, I like the idea. And then we had half an hour chatting about how to get him back on his bike, get him fit again so he can come and do the Cape Town Cycle Tour because <laughs> he hadn't done it in 10 years. Wow. So for him, it was, he knew exactly where this would go. Um, and the vision from, from his buy-in was immediate. Um, there was no regrets from, from their side. Um, ARN came on board as a, as a media partner for Dubai 92, hence mm. the title Spinney's Dubai 92. 92 was the theoretical distance that we wanted to do. We didn't want to make it too unattainable. You know, Dubai roads being nice and flat, it was, it was an easy distance for us to achieve. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that was the, the first one 14 or oh, 15 years ago, because we missed one year with COVID. So 15 years ago, uh, we had 460 riders join us on the start line. It was. It was probably the most emotional start of a race I've ever, ever witnessed because we were on um, the bridge going out of Sports City and um, all the riders were lined up there and we had like four or five police cars and um, some scary stories about uh, the, the communication. And it was just because the police were like, you want to do what? Okay, no problem. I knew that was fully supportive, 100% behind it, but they had never done this kind of thing before. Yeah. So I'm like, well, this is what I need you guys to do. I need all these roads closed. No. <laughs> we'll give you junctions we'll give you five cars like okay right great um so the police closed off the the the, the bridge for us we set up a little little gantry and the idea was to go off the gantry go up towards babel shams roundabout down al kale road around burj khalifa back up and finish on dubai autodrome and um once we set off all the riders at uh at just after six o'clock on uh december 4th or 5th i think it was 10th of december standing on the bridge watching all these riders go off and come back and, and all the work that we put into it as a cyclist, I was like, 
I really want to be there. I want to be in there. It was the hardest thing to watch all these 400 odd riders going off on a ride and they're going, as race director, I'm never ever going to be able to take part in this event. Yeah. Uh, it's just one of those things I'm going to watch everyone else go off and enjoy it. And from there, that kind of ignited the passion for making sure that what we're doing is safe, it's fun, and people are enjoying it. And it just it catapulted from there. It's, a, it's mostly like everything that you start that is driven by passion becomes successful. Yeah, because the way that you speak about it, you can just feel the passion that you have for cycling and, and bringing these events together, um, which which is critically important in any business success. But now, obviously, you're a CEO yourself. So tell us, right? tell us about your, where did the love start for Revolution? Love for Revolution. Um, you see, obviously, coming from a, a from a from a background of wanting to race, wanting to do stuff. Yeah. Um, and in the theater side, it's kind of a totally different uh, aspect. There's always been a customer service side to my persona. I was in restaurants and catering for many years. Then moved into MC work with the theater. Um, and it, I think it was kind of one of those things that it, it just happened in the right time and the right way. Again, nothing was ever planned on it. Um, we we're in the second year of uh, Spinney's 92. And, um, at that stage, it was just Donald and I running around getting the marketing together, obviously through his marketing company with Promo7, um, but trying to find sponsorship. I mean, at that stage, it wasn't easy to find sponsorship, especially for an event that it wasn't Formula One that was globally world recognized. Mm. You know, cycling has always had a, a kind of torrid past where people look and go, oh, it's good to be involved, it's not good to be involved. Um, and we needed to find to make it more commercially viable. So, well, let's go and attract to uh, chat to all the bike shops. Now, Donald had been going on about saying to me, you, we'll let's open up a bike shop, let's open up a bike shop. I'm thinking, I'm not sure I want to get into that. It's <laughs> you know, retail, I'm not sure. I like riding my bike, but am I going to enjoy selling bikes and fixing bikes and looking after stuff? And yeah, we went into some stores. Some of the stores got on board with it. And one of the stores was like, no, you're... Uh, your event uh, makes us enough money without us spending any money on marketing and advertising. Why should we get involved in marketing and spend oh, money on it? Oh, what <laughs> so, a slap that yeah, is. Yeah, it was. So I went, <laughs> wow, okay, interesting. Nice response. So you're not prepared to give back? Like, okay, fine, fair enough. So walked out the store, got on the phone to Don. I was like, you know what? I've been thinking about it. If, uh, <laughs> if that's the kind of attitude that what I've just faced now, let's open up a bike shop. And yeah, myself. There's that red flag. Like, that oh, was yeah, that cool. exactly yeah, that little red flag. Let me flag. go and do this myself yeah. then. So went off and attracted, um, went to, to Eurobike in Germany, which is like the big bike fair. Found, and that was, that was like, I mean, it was the Wild West type of style. There was all the guys that have started opening up bike shops now were there around that period of time. You know, sort of 2011, 2012, you go to Eurobike, all the big brands are there. And it was just manic. You could see guys running all over the place trying to secure brands that you could be the distributor for and work with. I had a list of people that I knew from my days of racing. These are the brands that I wanted to work with and I yeah. wanted to distribute. Um, and yeah, we signed up some, uh, some really good brands and some distribution rights for UAE and GCC. Um, open up a tiny little store and because of what we had had of a network, again, couldn't have planned this going, well, let's, let's build a, a cycle community group and then let's get a, an event going. Now we've got a massive database. Well, let's open up a bike shop. That as a business plan yeah. makes sense. But I mean, if you were to try and to do that from a, from a finding backing or anybody to sponsor it, like no. So when we opened the store, when we opened Revolution Cycles, we had a really good name and reputation for being passionate about cycling, yeah. knowing what we're talking about. And it wasn't, it wasn't, obviously you're in business and you have to make revenue and you have to make a profit. But that wasn't the deciding factor for us going into. It was a case of, well, let's get into something that we can give back to the community. So if we're sponsoring events and Revolution sponsor a stack of events to make sure that it's not just the high-end riders that are getting looked after, we've got the, the kids on the bikes and the junior rides, we've got, um, we've got triathlons. I mean, I'm not a triathlete by any stretch of the imagination, but we get on board and we support them because we know what an athlete's journey is like. It's a very stressful position to be in. Exactly. And it wasn't yeah. all about revenue generation. We're in this to make a profit. We've got KPIs that we have to hit and we need to see the numbers going. It was like, well, let's open the doors, give yeah. decent service, make sure the products that we're selling is at a good price and we can use funds back again to support and promote the events. And, yeah. and that was how it worked. Well, he's a massive techie. Yeah. Right? Like he, he, bought, he bought tech for his bike before he even had a bike. Now that's so, a man I love. So, <laughs> that's a good call. So, so for someone like like Sajoy, right? Yeah. Um, what what advice would you give him? I mean, it, it literally, I mean, 
he's got toys that are in the storeroom that we haven't even touched yet. Okay. So what what is available to new cyclists? How would you get them on board? What kind of cycle would you? I mean, it's because you have this passion for it. You've been involved in it. You've got the retail store now for it, and obviously learned a lot about the different brands. What what would advice would you be able to give someone like Sanjoy that wants to get into cycling and? And actually start using the toys that he bought. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that the the easiest route to get back onto it, and as you've you've committed to it by making those purchases. I think that um, getting back out now, the weather's getting better. We've got amazing facilities. You know, the Alcudra Cycle Track is, yeah. is is second to none the best place to get out and go and ride. Um, I would suggest go out and start a little five k ride. Don't put any pressure on yourself. Go out and just enjoy that. Go and enjoy the, the early morning with the sun coming up, the birds chirping. Yeah. If you can do a ride to a place where you can get a coffee, that's a good tick in the box yeah. in the right direction. Yeah, I've been doing that. Only thing is it's it's the reoccurrence of, of the injuries that, you know, flare up again. Yeah. You know, so I've I've done twenty K, you know, a couple of times, uh, but but every year it's that way. I'll service my bike. Yep. And then I'm on the track. And then I then I have my knees you know, swelling up yeah. and the back pain again. And I say, okay, I'll give this a break. And then it's a one year break. <laughs> and then you service your bike <laughs> yeah. again. And you service your you bike know? again, yeah. <laughs> Maybe stop servicing and just buy a new one. Just yes. need a new bike. Forget <laughs> it. Just buy a new bike. I know a shop that can help you out. <laughs> um, I would suggest, look, if you are having reoccurring in- injuries and things that are hurting, and this yeah. goes back to, to years of, of, of riding and racing, that there are certain things and certain criteria that that will start to hurt. I mean, like mm. when people say, oh, but it, it's really sore on your bum. Like, yeah, it is. It, it, it's sore for the first couple of weeks until you get accustomed to the saddle. It's getting, it's called being saddle fit. And it's the same as when you ride a horse or a motorbike. You know, it, that position is just a bit odd to, to bruise and have a saddle and put all the weight on it. Um, I would suggest getting a, a bike fitting done. You know, there's, there's a number of really good bike fitters and I'm not just saying that to promote us, but there's a number of really good bike uh, fitters in the community that would be able to look at it and maybe go, maybe your saddle's too high, your saddle's too low and that's putting a lot of pressure on your knees. You know, everybody always wants to be as fast as possible on their bike. I dial it back and go, you know what, if your back is sore, stop stretching so far out. Do you want to go out and enjoy the ride today, tomorrow, maybe the next day and continue to do that? If you're going to go out for a fast bike ride, and you're in a super aerodynamic aggressive position, it puts a lot of strain on your body. And if you do that fast ride today, tomorrow you might not feel like you want to go for a bike ride. And then like the next day will pass and the next day will pass. So you'll end up going, you know what, two weeks have passed, summer's coming and going, maybe I'll get into cycling next season. And if you miss that boat, you 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 want to get into it. So I would suggest bring your bike into us. We can take a look and see the fitting size, see where you are. Just generally put you into a more relaxed position. Um, and then get your passion and enjoyment back into the sport. And what's your advice for somebody who who's getting it, into it for the first time? What kind of bike do they sh- should they start with? Because that's that's always right the question. Yeah. I had the same thing in my head. What kind of bike do I need to start with? Yeah. You know, do <clears throat> do I just get a multi terrain so I can use it everywhere, and not restrict it to one track? Yeah. Or like, how does a person decide on something like this? So I think looking at, um, if you've got a history of uh, being in cycling from youth, when you used to ride to school or to work or whatever it was, if that if you know how to ride your bike, you know kind of the level of passion that you've got for it. If we've got a lot of ex-football players and ex-rugby players and ex-runners, all kind of over the age of 50, they're going, eh, knees are going, back's going, you know, joints are a bit sore, getting into the sport. I would suggest that the most, coming from a background, not an affluent kind of just, ah, oh, let's go and spend 50 grand on a new bike. I don't suggest that at all. And say, go out and find something that's good for you, fit for purpose. So I would suggest um, hiring a bike for a couple of weeks, seeing if you enjoy it. If you go, right, I enjoy it. Then set your budget and go, how much do I enjoy this? Because you can spend 50, 60,000 dirhams on a bike. It's not going to make the, the event more comfortable. It's not going to make it yeah. more pleasurable because you spent so much money on your bike. It's going to, I mean, it could be the opposite. You know, you've spent that much money on the bike and you don't like it. Two weeks time, you're going to try and sell it and you get 30, 40 grand for it. So it's not going to be a pleasurable experience. Hire a bike for a couple of weeks, see that you enjoy it. Go out with a couple of mates, get a couple of like-minded friends, make a little group, go ride together. Because once you're committed to riding with a buddy, it's so much harder to give up and say, hey, Johan, I'm not coming for a ride tomorrow. That, it's like yeah. a gym, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you've got a gym buddy, <laughs> yeah. it's the same. Get a cycling buddy and go for something that's within your pace and just enjoy that. And then I always say to people once they've, they've, they've set their budget, my frame of reference is always buy the most expensive frame you can afford because you can always upgrade the components, the wheels, the group sets, all that you can, you can upgrade if you've got a really good frame. And I'm not saying that you have to go and buy and spend 80 grand on a frame. Just think about it and go, 
I'm never going to ride the Tour de France. I'm never going to be um, riding the Giro Italia or the Volta Espana. But what is it that's within my budget that I can enjoy? Mm. What can I get past the Ministry of Finance? You know, the wife at home. What can you get past her? Yeah. Um, no, but that's now actually a very interesting point because you, you're referencing... 50,000, 60,000, 80,000 yeah, for, yeah. for a frame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's like that's like a deposit on a really nice car. Absolutely. Um, what 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 is what kind of like starting money are we talking about if somebody just wants to like you say let's say I've now I've now hired a bike yep. which I think is a really good idea by the way. Um, I saw one of those services that you had was hiring a bike and I was like why would somebody hire a bike? But yeah. now it makes complete sense. But let's say we, we've hired a bike and, you know, we like, yeah, maybe want to go once a week or twice a week and just ride for the fun of it. What kind of investment would somebody have to make to to get into it and, and still be having a decent bike? Yeah, absolutely. It's an amazing question because I, I reference those kind of figures because that's the, the kind of the highest echelon that you can go yeah. to. And those are Tour de France winning bikes. I mean, it's like you're into motor racing and you want to buy a car and you go and buy a formula one car because you've got that kind of money and you just, you know, you'll never be able to drive it to the ability of what that car can do um from a bike point of view there's some very good um bikes and frames that you can get onto and i'm going to say conservatively and it, i hope it doesn't scare anybody away from it, but i think between five and ten thousand dirhams mm. is a really good place to be getting in a, on a bike um, anything lower than that, you're kind of getting second grade components that okay. we live in a very harsh environment, you know, yeah. the summer, the, the sand, and we only got three, yeah. four months of off weather. But if it's not cared for and looked after well enough, then you're kind of going, well, that was four grand that I wasted, you know, and you're going to spend another four grand. You could have just bought an eight grand bike. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I say. Buy the most expensive that you can buy, that you can afford. Go for a, a good name brand that's that's got reputation from a store that's you know that's not just there to make the sale. Yeah. Um, if I can reference a shop, Revolution's a really good place to go. <laughs> <laughs> but the and it's close. And it's close. It's <laughs> by, yeah. And we deliver. Um, but you, you also have a, a rental unit at Kudra. No, we don't. No, we don't. Okay. So where uh, do you do your rentals from? We do our rentals directly from our store. Um, Which one? Revolution Cycles is in uh, Motor City. We're right on the on the Dubai Waterdrome. On Drum, okay. Um, when we were doing the design for the Al Qudra Cycle Track, we were offered the the location for it, um, and it was. I knew that there was going to be a 50-50 chance of how well it's going to work out. Um, but again, it wasn't. We weren't in the mindset of doing uh, retail at that stage. You know, when we. Yeah got yeah. involved with the, the RTA and the Dubai Sports Council and the municipality for the design of the cycle track. It, it wasn't on our radar for getting into the retail. We were like, we were more on the event side, getting people out and enjoying it yeah. and having fun. Re Revolution wasn't, wasn't, yeah, it was still a, a yeah, was not even a thought. Well, you know what, From just from a business perspective, that was a very good choice because it's always about where's your marketplace. Yeah. So what you did essentially was you created your own marketplace and then went, all right, now we have the market. Yeah. Now. How can we how can we service that right as opposed to the other way around having to try and create the market of when you already have the product? So I think that was a good way to grow it. Now he's a massive techie. I've started getting into the tech myself, and yep. I yep. quite a lot, quite like it. What kind of tech is available for for cyclists? I mean, you you mentioned you've got something that you got <laughs> before you bought your but bike. But now, now it's now it's a, now it's on your phone. Yeah, I'm talking about probably 10, 15 years ago. When I was at a show in US and I and I saw this prototype of of this little device that would have a wire that goes down and and tracks the spinning of the wheel yeah. and then gives you the speed at what you're cycling and the distance you cycle. That was not available on on iOS or any of the devices back then. I'm talking about 2010 or something. Yeah. So so that just excited me. So now I need to get the cycle because I want to try this prototype. Because <laughs> I met the guy, he wanted investment. I said, No, I'm not investing in this, but I'm very keen on trying that. You know, so a piece of tech. So, so that was something back then. But I know that there's lots changed now. You have, you know, geofencing. You've got so much more. There's things that we are going to launch in our app that yeah. tracks your location. Um, that's what the technology is allowing you to do today. But, but what's next? Oh, so if I reference back to you know when I started riding, eight nine years yeah. old, you know, you had your 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 computers. And I think that in those days it was Cat Eye and Shimano, um, Suntour and Polar. 
And you're right, everything was cable driven and it yeah. was cable ties all over your bike and then you had a little speed sensor on the front which would which would pick up the magnet and the magnet had yeah. to be perfectly, perfectly aligned, exactly. otherwise it yeah. wouldn't pick it up. <laughs> yeah. Then you had the magnet on the on the crank arm to pick up your, your cadence <laughs> and then you had your heart rate strap and that was the heart rate strap, thank goodness, was wireless. Um, <laughs> And now technology is insane. I mean, you've, yeah. you'll have seen it on, on every aspect from the, the way Apple have developed yeah, their, exactly, their yeah. fitness apps yeah. and their, their, their stuff is just so insane. I mean, yeah. the data, um, if you do Strava, which is Facebook for cycling, theoretically, mm. um, you see the data which comes up on there, your, your cadence, your heart rate, your recovery time, uh, where you've cycled, who you've cycled with, you can do a flyby and find out who was on the track at the same time as you. You can see geographically what the hot areas are. I mean, we just came back from Bali and um, you can go into Strava and go, I want to go for a ride. Land in a random place in the world. Go, what if there's any bike riding? Go into Strava, heat map, see, oh, well, there's a nice route. And you can ride that route. Knowing that it's a hot route that people ride a lot, you go, well, it yeah. must be a safe route to ride. Yeah. Um, I mean, the last thing you want to do is go and take your bike out and go, well, there's a heat map on Sheikh Zayed Road. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, no, well, it does happen in November, mind you. It does happen in November. So but people actually cycle on Sheikh Zayed Road? So is that permitted also? No, 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 no. no, no. Uh, he's referencing the Dubai 3030 where you have the Dubai. Ah, ride. okay. That's yeah. <laughs> it was what, 28,000? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, yeah. it's, it's amazing. I mean, look, obviously for His Highness, and that's where we go back to where this all started mm -hmm. From. I mean, Nick and I had an idea and Donald and I had an idea with the, the cycle challenge. And um, if it wasn't for the backing of the royal family, you know, when we when we started Cycle Safe Dubai up on Al Qudra and um, I said to you that Babel Shams was the yeah. only place out on that road. There is another very, very uh, important place out on, on that road. So when we do the Fridays and Saturday rides, we would be 5, 10, 15, 20, 400, whatever it is going up and down the road. We didn't realize until it kept on happening, but there was a white G-Wagon that kept coming past with a number plate number one. Right? <laughs> and we were now a lot of people on a road that was usually never had people on it, let alone cyclists on it. Sheikh Mohammed's got uh, an area outside where the horse training is going on. He's also got, he went yeah, to Majlis yeah. and you know, up towards the, um, the, solar, the solar farm. So we would have Sheikh Mohammed ride past us regularly on a, on a Friday and Saturday. And as it grew, Obviously, the visionary that he is, he saw this getting busier and busier. Um, an interesting story is that one one Saturday, coming back from from Babel Shams on a coffee ride, um, we got pulled over by the RTA and the Road and Transport Authorities, and like, oh, what have we done? There's, <laughs> there's a lot of us on the road, and um, yeah, the guy said, look, uh, Shame Mohammed seen you on the road. It's dangerous. Uh, he doesn't want to stop it. Wants to encourage it. Uh, he wants to build you a cycle track. What do you want? Oh, what? Wow. <laughs> like, what, what a story. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. And then we started um, working with the RTA and uh, Dubai Municipality, Dubai Sports Council to, to put this into place. And the speed at which that track went down, within six months we had 30 kilometers of cycling track and then it was 80 and then it was 100 and it's 200. Um, yeah, and it went mad. Yeah, that's, um, that's Dubai. That's, yeah. That is Dubai. Yeah. That is Dubai. Yeah, one of the rides we went on um, a year into living in Dubai, we went on a, on, a, on a group ride and we were riding past Maidan and at that stage it was the, uh, the Nadal Sheba uh, camel race track uh, where Maidan is now. And there was this beautiful ornate building and some concrete uh, paths around nothing. There was just nothing down there. And um, I, said to, I said to a guy on the bike, I said, um, what area is, where area is that? Can we, can we ride in there? And the guy with a, a very staunch accent was like, no, no, you, you can't ride there. I'm like, oh, okay, why? No, it's the Sheikh's land, and uh, you, you can't ride on there, and it's it's not permitted. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, again, <laughs> little red flag. Like, hmm. Now a couple of people at the engineer's office. Let me have a chat. Phone up my mates, and said, just I got an idea about something down there. What do you think we could do? I said, yeah, let me see what we can do. It's not used anymore. Let let me see what happens. Again, nothing happened for three, four months. Summer comes, summer goes. Phone rings. A mate from engineer's office. Hey Stuart, um, are you busy? Right. Well, yeah, shop's open, I'm busy. I've um, got a meeting down here at uh, the Camel Racetrack. Can you come? Like, yeah, when? Now. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop what again. I'm doing, come now. Uh, okay, again, <laughs> Dubai. So like, yeah, I'll be there on there quick, no problem. I know it's half an hour, 45 minutes down the old uh, Old KL Road, through the roundabouts, over the speed bumps. Um, jump the car, I'm halfway down there. Phone rings again, Nathan's on the phone. Stuart, where are you? I'm like, dude, it's, I'm, I'm halfway there, I'm coming. Oh, there's people waiting for you. 
get in on what I've walked into. And I'm most of the time, I mean, again, shorts and t-shirt, and that's me. And to this day, I don't know who it was, but um, there was a lot of gents in their dish dashes and a, and a lady in a, in a very smart outfit, smart suit. And Nathan introduced me to Sheikh so-and-so, and I don't know who it was, so no disrespect there. Um, engineer so-and-so, director so-and-so, and architect what-what. I'm like, okay, what do, I, what do you need me for? What can I help you with? No, well, Sheikh Mohammed has uh, offered this land to be made into a cycle track. Um, these are the engineers, these are the designers. Can you tell them what you need and what you want? <laughs> like, what? Okay. So then like, uh, uh, being a kind of moderate South African boy, Scottish background, like, well, so, well, if we can get maybe a few lights and maybe a container or something where we can just park our bikes. And, and I went through a whole little list of like really kind of rudimentary things that we would like. Just the woman stopped, she said, Stuart, no, sorry. Um, you're asking the wrong questions here. You're asking me for absolutely the wrong things. I think oh, I've pushed my envelope. She says, ask me for a Rolls Royce and I'll give you a Mercedes Benz. Right now, you're asking for a TRT Yaris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? She says, yeah, ask me for what you really want. What, what would make this perfect for you? I said, well, then I want solar lights all the way around the track. I want a four, six and an eight K loop using this, this area. I want a change room, I want this and I just, Done, 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 done. Yeah, no problem. And within a month, we had what was then became known as the Nadashiba Cycle Track. Wow. And is now Maidan District 1 Cycle Track with DX Bike. It, it exploded. So the moral of the story is, goes back to the visions and the ideas that I had were just the right place with the ruling family being as much into sport as they are. Sheikh Mohammed saw what I'm assuming saw the growth of it. Yeah. Jumped on and said, that's a good idea and put it behind it and just put his name behind it. And when the big boss says do something, it gets done. And it's done really fast, really quick. And Nato Shiba is, I mean, now it's Maidan cycle track and uh, you got multi-million dollar villas in the middle of a, a cycling track, which is eight Ks long with a, the tartan track. I've never done that track actually. Have you done that track? No, I haven't done that. I've only been doing Kudra. <laughs> Kudra is stunning. I mean, yeah. Kudra is great. We've got some new developments that are coming on uh, Al Kudra in the next couple of months. So there's a lot more things to happen. I mean, obviously with the with the push and uh, you know, there's everybody enjoying cycling globally and seeing you know, the the Tour de France is getting viewership numbers that are outrageous. I mean, it's, yeah, uh, but I, I think even the Giro d'Italia that yeah. that's also yeah. benefited from that because now people go like, oh, it's only the Tour de France. No. And then obviously the broadcast has picked up and went, ooh, yeah. let's see if somebody else would watch something else. And now that's getting the exposure as 100%. well. 100%. So it does help. I mean, it even it, it, even the mountain biking events. Oh. I mean, from all over the world. Then there's a race in New Zealand. And then the next weekend you switch your TV yeah. on and all of a sudden there's one from the UK. And you go, yeah. well, I didn't even know this existed. Yeah. And you see crowds at these events and you go like, I've never even seen oh. or heard of this event. Yeah. So. It is, it is experiencing a huge amount of growth. And the, the viewership on the, the Tour de France, it is the largest sporting event, television coverage-wise, in the world. Mm. You know, so you look at these, these big-name riders that are on there, and they're getting six, seven million euros for, for riding their bike. And people go, oh, they just ride their bike. Yeah, they do it for three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> they do it for three weeks yeah. up proper mountains. I mean, this is a profession, you know, and these guys are on proper athletes. Yeah. I hope that that starts, I mean, that goes into a different, a different kettle of fish, but I think... I hope that that money that the that the, the 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 sponsorship and the marketing brings into the sport that the athletes start getting. You look at the amount of money like the, the Ronaldos and the Messes and that 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 they yeah. bring to it, and they are iconic figures. So if we've got the same with the riders that are winning the tour now, you know the Vot van Arts and the Vingegaards, inspiring young athletes to go. I want to be the next Vot van Art and yeah. then be able to make a good amount of money out of it. You know, you got the domestics and the team that don't make you the kind of money, but they are the guys, the workhorses. You know, they're the ones that are out there yeah. doing all the work for the votes and the, the Van Arts and uh, the Tades. I mean, Tade Pogacar is an incredible rider. We had, yeah, we could, we could diversify on that for hours. Thank you very much for sharing Thank your you. experience and a little bit of a, the history of where the, the cycling community started here in Dubai. If you guys want to go out and support Revolution Cycles down in Motor City, that'll be great. Uh, it's a fantastic little place to go to. Um, they do, like I said, hiring of cycles. So if you want to get into it, go and hire a cycle, watch and follow our podcast, share it, please. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you.